chapter eleven of the egregious english by t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen poets it may be set down as an axiom that a nation which is in the proper enjoyment of all its faculties which is healthy wealthy wise and properly conditioned must be producing a certain amount of poetry from the beginning this has been so it will be so to the end when england was at her highest when the best in her was having full play she produced poets right down into the victorian era she went on producing them then she took to the stock exchange and an ostentatious way of life and the supply of poets fell off if we except mr swinburne who does not belong rightfully to this present time there is not a poet of any parts exercising his function in england to-day furthermore any bookseller will tell you that the demand for poetry books by new writers has practically ceased to exist these statements will be called sweeping by a certain school of critics and i shall be asked to cast my eye round the english nest of singing birds and to answer and say whether mr so-and-so be not a poet and mr so-and-so and mr so-and-so and mr so-and-so i shall also be asked to say if i am prepared to deny that of mr so-and-so's last volume of verse three hundred copies were actually sold to the booksellers for the propounders of such questions i have one answer namely it may be so in the meantime let us do our best to find an english poet who is worth the name and who is prescriptively entitled to be mentioned in the category which begins with chaucer and ends with mr swinburne shall we try mr rudyard kipling tested by sales and the amount of dust he has managed to kick up mr kipling should be a poet of parts he is still young and happily among the living but it cannot be denied that as a poet he has already outlived his reputation two years ago he could set the english-speaking nations humming or reciting whatever he chose to put into metre some of his little things looked like lasting already the majority of them are forgotten to the next generation if he be known at all he will be known as the author of three pieces recessional the l'envoi appended to life's handicap and mandalay what is to become of such verses as the following have you heard of the widow at windsor with a hairy gold crown on her head she has ships on the foam she has millions at home and she pays us poor beggars in red ow oh, poor beggars in red there's her nick on the cavalry horses there's her mark on the medical stores and her troopers you'll find with a fair whim behind that takes us to various wars poor beggars barbarous wars and is to the widow at windsor and is to the stores and the guns the men and the horses that makes up the forces o oh, miss victorier's sons poor beggars victorier's sons at the time of their appearance these lines and the like of them were vastly admired everybody read them most people praised them they were supposed to stir the english blood like a blast of martial trumpets here at length was the poet england had been waiting for there could be no mistake about him he had the authentic voice the incommunicable fire the master touch he had come to stay at the present moment the bulk of his metrical work is just about as dead and forgotten as the coster songs of yesteryear he has not even made a cult nobody quotes him nobody believes in him as a poetical master nobody wants to hear any more of him his imitators have all gone back to the imitation of better men if a copy of verses have a flavour of kipling about it nowadays editors drop it as they would drop a hot coal so much for the poet of empire the poet of the people the metrical patron of thomas atkins esq another poet of empire mr w e henley has fared very little better what can i do for england is i believe still in request among the makers of a certain class of anthology but english poetry in the bulk is just the same as if mr henley had never been even the balderdash about my indomitable soul has fallen out of the usus loquende of young men's christian associations and young men's debating societies the song of the sword is sung no longer for england's sake has gone the way of all truculent war poetry 
and out of hawthorn and lavender perhaps a couple of lyrics remain mr henley attacked burns when burns had been a century dead who will consider it worth while to attack mr henley in say the year two thousand and two possibly the real true english poet who will in due course put on the laurel of mr austin is mr stephen phillips yet mr stephen phillips is a purveyor of metrical notions for the stage and in his last work ulysses i find him writing as follows athene father whose oath in hollow hell is heard whose act is lightning after thunder word a boon a boon that i compassion find for one the most unhappy of mankind zeus how is he named athene ulysses he who planned to take the towered city of troyland a mighty spearsman and a seaman wise a hunter and at need a lord of lies with woven wiles he stole the trojan town which ten years battle could not batter down oft hath he made sweet sacrifice to thee zeus nodding benevolently i mind me of the savoury smell athene yet he when all the other captains had won home was whirled about the wilderness of foam for the wind and the wave have driven him evermore mocked by the green of some receding shore yet over wind and wave he had his will blistered and buffeted unbaffled still ever the snare was set ever in vain the lotus island and the siren strain through scylla and charybdis hath he run sleepless plunging to the setting sun who hath so suffered or so far hath sailed so much encountered and so much quailed which is exactly the kind of poetry one requires for the cavern scene of a new year's pantomime possibly again the real true english poet is mr william watson with his tiresome mimicry of wordsworth and his high and dry style of lyrical architecture mr watson is believed to have done great things but his role now appears to be one of austere silence he is what the old writers would have termed a costive poet and if his collected poems are to be the end of him his end will not be long deferred or possibly the one and only poet our england of to-day would wish to boast is mr arthur simons mr simons writes just the kind of poetry one might expect of a versifier who in early youth had loved a cigarette-smoking ballet girl and could never bring himself to repress his passion here is a sample of mr arthur simons at his choicest the feverish room and that white bed the tumble skirts upon a chair the novel flung half opened where hat hairpins puffs and paints are spread and you half dressed and half awake your slant eyes strangely watching me and i who watch you drowsily with eyes that having slept not ache this uh, need one dread nay dare one hope will rise a ghost of memory if ever again my handkerchief is scented with white heliotrope no doubt if the english continue to descend the moral avernus at their present rate of speed mr simons will become by sheer process of time the representative poet of the nation it is part of a poet's duty to look into the future and mr simons appears to have taken the next two or three generations of englishmen by the forelock may he have the reward which is his due for the rest they all mean well and they all aim high but one is afraid that nothing will come of them there are francis thompson and lawrence hausman and henry newbolt and lawrence binion and f b manicuts and arthur christopher benson and victor parr amiable performers all but each a standing example of poetical shortcoming perhaps one ought not to mention mr john davidson and mr w b yeats because mr davidson is a scot and mr yeats putatively at any rate an irishman in some respects these twain may be considered the pick of the basket i am constrained to admit however that neither of them has as yet fulfilled his earlier promise so that on the whole england is practically without poets of marked or extraordinary attainments the reason is not far to seek she is losing the breed of noble bloods her greed her luxuriousness her excesses her contempt for all but the material are beginning to find her out 
her youths who should be fired by the brightest emotions are bidden not to be fools and taught that the whole duty of man is to be washed and combed and financially successful consequently that section of english adolescence which in the nature of things begins with poetry and gladness very speedily throws up the sponge consecration to the muse is no longer thought of among englishmen they cannot be content to be published and take their chance the dismal shibboleth of poetry does not pay wears them all down what is the good of writing verses which bring you neither reputation nor emolument one must live and to live like a gentleman by honest toil and devote one's leisure instead of one's life to poetry is the better part meanwhile england jogs along quite comfortably she can get keats for a shilling and shakespeare for sixpence why should she worry herself for a moment with the new men end of chapter eleven chapter twelve fiction after much patient thinking the english have come to the conclusion that there is but one branch of literary art and that its name is fiction and by fiction the english really mean the six-shilling novel i do not think it too much to say that since the six-shilling novel was first thrust upon our delighted attention it has never brought within its covers six shillings worth of reading the high priest and high priestess who serve to the right and left of the altar of six shillingism are as every one knows mr hall Caine and miss marie corelli each of them wears a golden ephod with a breastplate of jewels arranged to spell out the magic figures one hundred thousand all the other priests of the tabernacle look with awe and envy upon these two because the other priests breastplates have hard work to spell out fifty thousand and some of them do not even achieve one thousand five hundred burnt offerings of cain and corelli therefore fill the place with savour a pair of sorrier writers never was on sea or land everybody knows it nobody denies it and nobody seems sad about it the six shilling novel is an established english institution cain and corelli are its prop and stay and the rest do their best to keep in the running and pick up the minor money-bags the perusal of six shilling fiction is practically a sort of mania it has seized in its grip the fairest england has to show particularly matrons the younger women and stockbrokers for the englishwoman the daily round would lose its saltness did she not have handy the newest six shilling novel by mr cain miss corelli or the next literary baller in the market-place there are shops called libraries to which the englishwoman repairs for her supplies of literary pabulum here the six-shilling novel has a great time strapped together in sixes or packed in boxes of dozens it is handed forth to the carriages of its fair devourers and taken right away to its repose in the cultured homes of bayswater and Densington. from morning till night many englishwomen do little but read this precious stuff what they get out of it amounts in the long run to hysteria and anemia it brings about a general deadening of the mind and a general jaggedness of the emotions coupled with an utter incapacity to take any save an exaggerated view of the facts of life discontent disillusionment ennui boredom ill-temper a sharp tongue and a cynical spirit are other symptoms which the six-shilling novel is prone to evoke the habit is worse than opium or hashish or tea cigarettes it is just the devil and that is all you need say about it the persons employed in the opium traffic are supposed to be very wicked to my mind the persons employed in the fiction traffic are as wicked as wicked can be when the foul disease began first to make its ravages obvious there were not wanting persons who would have checked it and provided remedies for it these persons squeaked somewhat and nothing more has been heard of them so the thing goes on unrestrained and even applauded by press and pulpit alike and the englishwoman has become a confirmed inveterate and incurable fiction reader if a man have an enemy to whom he would do an abiding injury let him persuade that enemy to obtain the six more popular six-shilling novels of the moment and read them through 
if the man's enemy sticks to his bargain at which however he will probably shy in the middle of the second volume the chances are that he gets up from that reading a broken and spiritless man his brain will be as saggy as a sponge full of treacle and his vision as unreliable as that of the alcoholist who always saw two cabs and invariably got into the one that was not there seriously however what is there about this english fiction or for that matter about scottish fiction that men and women should buy it and devour it to the exclusion of all other literary fare it is ill-written it is not original it is not like life it is not beautiful it is not inspiring it does not touch the profound emotions it means nothing and it ends nowhere the reason of its popularity is that it appeals to an indolent habit of mind and as a general rule is calculated to excite the passions and particularly to open up questions which experience has shown to be best left alone in nine cases out of ten where a popular work of fiction is concerned it is always possible to put one's finger on the chapter or passages on which its popularity is based and in nine cases out of ten that chapter or those passages have to do with sexual matters the questions which arise out of the relation of man and woman are no doubt vitally important and most interesting but that they should be discussed in an unscientific irresponsible and catchpenny way by anybody who can trail a pen is something of a scandal if an author can succeed in inventing a sexual situation which could not by any possible chance exist for a moment in real life or if he can put a glow and a gloss on the triteness of love and lust his success as a fictionist is to all intents and purposes assured what is sometimes spoken of as wholesome fiction scarcely exists anyway nobody reads it it is the carefully constructed book about sex that sells and is read such a book need not be flagrant as was once thought to be the case it can be a work of art a thing of veiled suggestion delicate unobjectionable and seemingly meet to be read one has hesitation in asserting that such books ought not to be written or ought not to be circulated it is difficult to justify any attitude of intolerance in such a matter yet the fact remains that the maids and matrons of england together with the men who have the leisure and sufficient lack of brains to read fiction are being stuffed season by season and year by year with about the most undesirable kind of sexual philosophy that could well be placed before them of any englishwoman of the leisured class above the age of sixteen years it may be said as was said of the late professor jowett in a different sense what i don't know isn't knowledge and the instructor in all cases is a fictionist if a man took his notion of business or politics or art out of six shilling novels he would be set down for a fool yet most english women get their view of love and the married relation from these extraordinary works and it is taken for granted that nobody is a penny the worse for my own part i should incline to the opinion that the only persons who are a penny not to say six shillings the worse are the english middle and upper classes as a body much has been said in derision of what the english call the kelliard school of fiction kelliard fiction being i need scarcely say a brand of fiction written by scotsmen usually in scotland and sold in the english and the american markets everybody of taste and judgment cheerfully admits that kelliarders are not persons of genius for the delectation of the southerner they have made a scotland of their own the which however is not scotland they have made a scottish sentiment a scottish point of view a scottish humour a scottish pathos and even a scottish dialect which may be reckoned quite doubtful at the same time one looks in vain to the kailyarders for anything that is worse than slobber anything really noxious and dreadful that is to say one might read kailyard forever and a day without coming to great moral grief indeed i would point out that on the whole the kailyard system of ethics partakes somewhat of the character of the system of ethics which used to be unfolded in the melodrama of our grandfathers days 
virtue rewarded vice punished is the moral upshot of it and in any case and let it be as bad and as meretricious and as greatly to be deprecated as one will we must always remember that the kailyard book is a work invented and manufactured not for scotsmen but for the anglo-saxon the englishman and his offshoots some months back a considerable hubbub arose in english literary circles because m jules verne had been saying to an interviewer at amiens of all places in the world that the novel as a form of literary expression was doomed and would gradually die out of popular favour it is safe to say that in the eyes of sundry critics of pretty well every nationality the novel has been doomed any time this last fifty years yet the novel comes up smiling every time since it was reduced in price to six shillings in england it has undoubtedly deteriorated not only as a piece of writing but also in the matter of ethical intention so long as it remains the prey of some of its latter-day exploiters so long will it continue to deteriorate so long as the english mind continues to be feeble and unwholesome and yearn for artificial thrills and undesirable emotions so long will english fiction continue to be of its present decadent quality as the capitalist says it is all a question of supply and demand the great aim of writers of fiction or at any rate of ninety nine per cent of them is to produce an article that will sell you must turn out what the public want and they will assuredly buy it the knack of hitting the public taste looks easy to acquire and the fictionist strives after it with all his might many are called to make fortunes out of novel writing few are chosen but nobody can examine the work of those few without perceiving that for weal or woe principally for woe they know their business of course it goes without saying that a very considerable amount of fiction is published in england which is just as mild and just as innocuous as tinned milk to this puling variety of fiction however the english do not appear to be very greatly drawn it crops up with great regularity every publishing season it is solemnly reviewed in the critical journals and it even stands shoulder by shoulder with stronger meat in the bookshops but the fact remains that it does not sell to see second edition on it is the rarest occurrence in fine the english will have their fiction spiced and highly spiced or not at all mealy-mouthed writers over reticent over blushful over austere writers they do not want neither have they any admiration for a writer who is plagued with a feeling for style and who may be reckoned an artist in the collocation of words their much vaunted meredith has never had the sale of a crockett or a berry or a hawking or for that matter of a j k jerome the english have little or no literary taste little or no literary acumen and they expect their fictionists to give them anything and everything save what is edifying end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the egregious english by t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen suburbanism of old that is to say twenty years ago the great majority of the english people suffered from a mental and general disability which was termed provincialism if you hailed from manchester or liverpool or birmingham or edinburgh or glasgow the kind gentleman in london who sized people up and put them in their places assured you that you were a provincial and that you would have to rub shoulders a great deal with the world by which they meant london before you could rightly consider yourself qualified to exist against the epithet provincial however not a few persons rebelled when it was applied flatly to themselves most men of feeling felt hurt when you called them provincial in the world of letters and journalism to call a man provincial was the last and unkindest cut of all and it usually settled him just to say that he has no sense of humour settles him to-day then up rose thomas carlyle and robert buchanan and a few lesser lights who said you call us provincials provincials we undoubtedly are and we glory in the character 
this rather baffled not to say amazed the lily-fingered london assessors and gradually the term provincial as a term of opprobrium passed out of use it is admitted now on all hands that the provincial is a very useful kind of fellow and when the metropolis feels itself running short of talent and energy the provincial is invariably invited to look in laterally however the londoner and the dweller in english provincial cities have begun to exhibit a distinctly modern disorder which may be called for want of a better term suburbanism in london which may be taken as the type of all english cities suburbanism is pretty well rampant it has its origin in what the americans would call location a man's daily work lies say in the city or in the central quarters of london for various reasons such as for example as considerations of health expenditure and custom it is practically impossible for him to live near his work he must live somewhere so he goes to balham or tooting or clapham or bronsbury or highgate or willesden or finchley or couch end or hampstead or some other suburban retreat london is ringed round with these residential quarters these little towns outside the walls a visitor to any one of them is at once struck with its striking and painful similarity to all the others there is a railway station belonging to one of the metropolitan lines there is a high street fronted with lofty and rather gaudy shops there is a reasonable sprinkling of churches and chapels there is a brand new red brick theatre and the rest is row on row and row on row of villa residences each with its dreary palisading and attenuated grass plot in front and its curious annex of kitchen or scullery behind miles and miles of these villas exist in every metropolitan suburb worthy the name and though the rents and sizes of them may vary they are all built to one architectural formula and all pinchbeck ostentatious and unlovely no person of judgment nobody possessed of a ray of the philosophic spirit can gaze upon them without concluding at once that the english do not know how to live take a street of these villas big or little and what do you find you note first that nearly every house be it occupied by clerk jew financier or professional man has got a highfalutin name of its own the county council or local authority has already bestowed upon it a number but this is not enough for your suburbanist who must needs appropriate for his house a name which will look swagger on his letter-box hence number two sandringham road tooting is not number two sandringham road tooting at all but the laurels if you please number four not to be outdone is holmwood number six is hazeldean number eight the pines number ten sutherland house and so forth then again if you walk down a street and keep your eye on the front windows of this thoroughfare of mansions you will note that every one of those windows has cheap lace curtains to it and that immediately behind the centre of the window there is a little table upon which loving hands have placed a green high art vase containing a plant of sorts and right back in the dimness of the parlour there is a sideboard with a high mirrored back if you made acquaintance with half a dozen of the occupiers of these houses and were invited into the half dozen front rooms you would find in each in addition to the sideboard before mentioned a piano of questionable manufacture a brass music-stool with a red velvet cushion an overmantel with mirrored panels a saddle-bag suite consisting of ladies and gents and six ordinary chairs and a couch a centre-table with a velvet pile cloth upon it a bamboo bookcase containing a corelli and a hall crane or so together with some sixpenny dickenses picked up at draper's bargain sales nuttall's dictionary mrs beaton's house-book a bible a prayer-book some hymn-books a work-basket full of socks waiting to be darned and a little pile of music chiefly pirated at night when spriggs comes home to the laurels he has an apology for late dinner gets into his slippers and retires with mrs spriggs and perhaps his elder daughter into that parlour there he reads a halfpenny newspaper till there is nothing left in it to read 
then he talks to mrs spriggs about that beast so-and-so his employer and mrs spriggs tells him not to grumble so much and asks the elder daughter why she doesn't play a tune to liven us up a bit yes says spriggs what is the good of having a piano and me buying you music every saturday if you never play whereupon the elder daughter rattles through dolly gray the honeysuckle and the bee and everybody's loved by some one and spriggs beats time with his foot till he grows weary and thinks we had better have supper and get off to bed this kind of thing is going on right down both sides of sandringham road at homewood at hazeldean at the pines and at sutherland house as well as at the laurels every weekday evening between the hours of eight and midnight in point of fact it is going on all over tooting it is the suburban notion of an happy evening at home and hallowed as it is by wont and custom everybody in tooting takes it to be the best that life can offer after business hours perhaps it is just before supper or haply a little afterwards however spriggs says that he believes he will take a little stroll round the houses he puts on a straw hat in summer and a tweed cap in winter and proceeds gravely down the sandringham road until he reaches a break in the long array of villas and is aware of a rather flaring public-house into the saloon bar of this hostelry he walks staidly nods to the company and asks the barmaid for a drop of the usual let me see says that sweet lady johnny walker isn't it well you know it is says spriggs as he hands over threepence with the glass of whisky in his hand he retires to the nearest red plush settee and looks listlessly at the illustrated papers on the little table in front of him drinks somewhat slowly smokes a pipe exchanges a word about the weather with the landlord of the establishment says there's time for another before closing time has another and at twelve thirty trots off home the seven or eight other men in the saloon bar being respectively the occupiers of homewood hazeldean the pines sutherland houses etc have done almost exactly as spriggs has done in the way of drinks and nods and illustrated papers and having a final at twenty minutes past twelve but during the whole evening they have not exchanged a rational word with one another they have nothing to talk about therefore they have not talked they are neighbors and they know it but they all hold themselves to be so much superior to one another that they have scorned to speak to each other except in the most cursory and casual way next morning at a few minutes to nine o'clock they will all be scooting anxiously along the sandringham road with set faces damp brows and a fear in their hearts that they are going to miss their train they will travel in packed carriages half of them standing up while the other half growls to ludgate hill or moorgate street as the case may be and then rush off again to their respective offices in fear and trembling this time lest they should be three minutes late and the governor might notice it this is the life of the males in the sandringham road year in and year out through living in the same houses in the midst of the same furniture listening to the same pianos drinking at the same public houses going to business in the same trains they become as like one another as peas they are all anxious all dull all short of sleep all short of money in brief they have become suburbanized the monotony and snobbery and listlessness of their home life are reflected in their conduct of the working day's affairs there is not a man amongst them who has a soul above his job each of them sticks at business not because he loves it or likes it but simply because he knows that if he were discovered in a remissness he would get what he calls the sack each of them lunches oh this english lunch at the bar of a public-house on a glass of bitter beer and a penny welsh rarebit each of them feels a bit chippy and not a little sleepy of an afternoon and each of them races for his train in the evening chock full of worry and bad temper you must live in the suburbs if you are to live in london at all and there is no escape from it the lines of the female suburbians are cast in more or less pleasant places they do not need to go to town every day there are shops galore filled with just the goods they want round the corner and there is always the next female on both sides to gossip with 
for unlike the male suburbian the female suburbian will talk to her neighbours her conversation is of babes and butcher's meat and the peace at the theatre and the bargains at the stores in the high road and him he or him means the good lady's husband she never by any chance refers to him either by his christian name or his surname or as my husband it is always he said to me this morning or as i was saying to him before he went to business which i take it is a peculiarly english habit the female suburbian goes out to tea sometimes usually at the house of some suburban relative her dress is a curious blend of ostentation and economy she will be in the fashion and being an englishwoman expense is no object providing she can get the money she has no notion of thrift she is perennially in arrears with the milk and the insurance man and when money gets very tight indeed she lectures her husband on his wicked inability to make more than he is getting the whole life whether for male or female is dreary harried unrelieved and destructive of everything that tends to make life affable and tolerable in view of the obvious evils suburbanism has brought about in the english metropolis it might have been expected that the english provincial cities would have done their best to avoid similar troubles in their own areas so far from this being the case however the craze for suburbanism is making itself apparent wherever one turns city and borough councils lead the way by erecting at the public expense artisans and clerks dwellings well out of the town they hold that fresh air the open country and cheap railway fares are all that is wanted to make the english citizen's life a perennial joy to him yet the dwellings they erect are of the shoddiest and least homelike kind the fresh air which is to do the worker and the children so much good is a doubtful quantity and the cheap railway fares are bragged about without regard to the time taken up in travelling and the hurry and anxiety to catch trains suburbanism as a stereotyped and soul-deadening institution is of purely english origin in no other country in the world do convention and what other people will say so rule the lives of men as they do in england suburban is in many ways the most obvious of the many products of english convention it is at once an indication of brainlessness want of intelligence and incipient decay apparently there is to be no limit to it outside london new suburbs spring up almost weekly but their newness brings no changes in its strain each new suburb is mapped out and built exactly on the lines of the old ones each is destined for the reception of exactly the same kind of stupid people each will be the living ground of generations of people still more stupid End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen the man about town the english man about town and i am not acquainted with any other sort is to put it mildly a devil of a fellow who he may be how he gets a living whether he gets a living how and why he became a man about town and whether after all he is really a man about town are matters which are wrapped in mystery everybody knows him yet nobody knows much about him you meet him everywhere yet nobody can tell you how he gets there his acquaintance is astonishing ranging from dustmen to dukes as it were he cuts nobody though he is intimate with nobody he is familiar with his world and all that it expects of him and he plays the game skilfully correctly and as gentlemen should there are droves of him in london probably no other city in the world could with comfort accommodate so many of him he lives in the sun he is the joy and pride of the restaurateurs and the cafe keepers hearts no billiard-room is complete without him he shines at bars of onyx music halls and theatres could not get on without him and on the whole it is his useful and pleasing function to keep the west end of london and its offshoots going what the west end of london means to the man about town is a large question it means clubs in the morning with a tailor a hatter a bookmaker or two thrown in 
it means expensive lunches lazy somnolent afternoon big dinners hard drinking cards night clubs and a day that ends at three o'clock in the morning nobody but an englishman could stand the racket nobody but an englishman could find satisfaction in so doing the man about town is the last expression of an unhealthy plutocracy he is the child of means the son of his father the pampered darling of his mother and he has never understood that life was anything more than a frivolous holiday whether he has money or happens to have spent it all he sets the standard of expenditure for everybody who would be considered in the movement he also sets the fashion in hats coats trousers fancy waistcoats shoes walking sticks and scarf pins for englishmen at large it never occurs to him that he does this but he does it he it is who is the prime supporter and patron of the manly english sports horse racing glove fighting coaching moting polo shooting fishing yachting and so forth in these exercises he finds great delight when he is not busy dining and whining and painting the town red sport is the mainstay of his existence he is usually young till he reaches the age of thirty when he begins to decline rapidly but the older he gets the younger he gets although he may lose his hair and be compelled to have resort to false teeth and elastic stockings his spirits are invariably of the cheerfulest his laugh is boisterous his interest in life acute and he continues to be passionately fond of food and drink it is not till his locks become hoar his purse well-nigh empty and the number of his years well over threescore and ten that he begins to droop englishmen will point him out to you in cafes and say with hushed voices you see that man the one with the frowsy beard and his hat a-tilt well he spent a hundred and fifty thousand twice a hundred and fifty thousand my boy what did he do with it oh well what do people do with money there's a man sir that seen life used to have a house in berkeley square has owned three derby winners built the thingamabob theatre for miss jumping about knows everybody has hobnobbed with the king when he was prince of wales used to be hand in glove with the duke of blank and that crowd and now damn he hasn't a penny piece all this with the air of a person who is showing you something worth seeing it is the english fatuity first of all to admire the man who is possessed of wealth secondly to admire a man who is throwing his money away and thirdly to look with respectful awe upon the man who has thrown it away it warms the english heart and fires the english imagination to see the son of a recently deceased provision dealer playing the prince at the best hotels plunging at ascot and monte carlo buying up the stalls at the frivolity at the behest of lotte Futterfest, and generally flinging to the winds the hard-earned and to a great extent ill-gotten estate of his late lamented parent by all the best people by all the best english people that is to say such a youth is received and made welcome if not exactly taken to the bosom englishmen ask him to dinner simply because he has money they are aware that his courses will not bear examination that his tastes are gross that his intellect is none of the brightest he has nothing to say for himself he is neither entertaining nor amusing nor instructive the englishman has no ulterior motive upon him he does not hope to get him into this or that financial swim neither does he desire to marry his daughter to him he simply feels that it is well to be friendly with money and the man about town even a bankrupt or broke man about town is better to the englishman than none at all with such a person he will foregather and be pleasant in the sight of all men old so-and-so he says is a dear old sort he is broke of course and sometimes he rather worries one for sovereigns but i have never deserted a pal in adversity in my life and i'm not going to begin with old so-and-so thus your good snob englishman would lead you to believe that he was on terms of intimacy and affection with old so-and-so in old so-and-so's palmy money-squandering days whereas in point of fact he never clapped eyes on the man till he had spent his last farthing it is all very english and to a mere scot a trifle astonishing the scot if i know him at all takes no joys of spendthrifts 
however prettily dressed and least of all can he be brought to court the society of a man who has reduced himself to beggary by extravagance and riot the bare gift of prodigality and the bare reputation of having been wealthy are nothing to the scot if he wants men to admire he can find men of solider quality the englishman on the other hand has no great love for either solidity or worth the first makes him envious the second bores him though he may himself be a person of judgment and sober life he likes to have about him men who are going or who have gone the whole hog and who pursue their pleasures without restraint remorse or fear hence the man about town will always figure interestingly in english society there is romance about him he has been foolish and perhaps even wicked but he belongs to the select coterie of people who when all is said make the gay world go round end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the egregious english by t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen drink mr crossland has very kindly suggested that under the inspiring tutelage of the national bard scotland has become one of the drunkenest nations in the world i shall not retaliate as one might do but shall content myself by referring the reader to the easily accessible tables of statistics which render it quite plain that scotland's drunkenness is very considerably exceeded by the drunkenness of england in london at any rate strong drink flows like a river there are five thousand three hundred licensed houses in the metropolitan area alone in kilburn a suburb of more or less irreproachable respectability there are twenty-five churches and chapels and thirty-five public houses during late years public-house property has begun to be looked upon in the light of a gilt-edged investment turn where one will one finds the older inns are being swept away while on their sites are erected flaring gin palaces with plate-glass fronts elaborate mahogany fitments gorgeous saloon and private bars painted ceilings inlaid floors and electric lights throughout behind the bar instead of mine host of a former day and his wife and daughter there are half a dozen perked-up barmaids with rouged cheeks and a rosetti hair and a person called the manager who for two pounds a week runs the place for its proprietors a limited company which owns perhaps twenty or thirty other houses in the conduct of these mammoth drinking places three great points are kept in view namely that a quick drinking stand-up trade pays better than any amount of slow regular custom that the english drinker of the lower class cannot tell the difference between good drink and bad often preferring indeed the bad to the good and that as bad liquor is cheaper than good the sound commercial thing to do is to supply bad liquor with these admirable axioms continually before it the english trade has prospered amazingly more drink and worse drink is sold in england to-day than has ever been sold in england before through legislation intended to ensure sound liquor and the proper conduct of licensed houses the proprietors have consistently made a point of driving the usual brewer's dray in order to meet the food and drug adulteration act all spirits sold at this establishment while of the same excellent quality as heretofore are diluted according to strength the same excellent quality as heretofore is choice and so is diluted according to strength as for the beer we dilute also the beer according to strength when we are caught at it it is a mistake on the part of the cellarman who has been discharged and the fine is so small in proportion to the profit on selling water that we smile at the back of our necks and keep on diluting according to strength our whole system in fact is designed to make people drink and to make them drink the worst that we dare put before them now the scot drunkard or no drunkard does have something of a taste in liquor the best clarets have gone to scotland in spite of mr crossland since claret became a dinner wine you cannot put off a scot with either bad whisky or bad beer 
he knows what whisky should be and what beer should be and in scotland at any rate he never has any difficulty in getting them but the english taking them in the mass are quite the other way any sort of wine provided it be properly fortified and sophisticated passes with them for the real thing their scotch whisky is about the most wholesome thing they drink but large quantities of this are bought by english merchants in a crude state and rammed down the public throat without a thought to maturing blending and otherwise rendering the spirit potable english beer we have been told in song and story is the finest beer in the world yet nobody can visit an english brewery without discovering that english beer is not english beer at all glucose in the place of malt cassia and gentian in the place of hops finings in the place of storage are the universal order and so depraved and perverted has the fine old english taste in beer become that brewers who have set up to provide an honest article and sent it out to their customers have had it returned with the curt comment that nobody would drink such hogwash and what the customers wanted was beer and not brewer's apron every now and again scares crop up in consequence of the use of improper ingredients there is an inquiry a royal commission and the englishman still goes on stolidly drinking arsenic will not drive him away from his favourite tipple neither will coculus indicus or any of the round dozen abominations upon which the brewer's chemist makes his stand if there is one thing more than another that is considered the chief necessity of life in the english household of the poorer class it is beer and its sister beverage porter from morning till night the can is continually going between the house of the artisan and the neighbouring public the first thing in the morning the artisan himself must have a couple of goes of rum and milk by eleven o'clock he is ready for a pint of four half at noon when he knocks off for dinner he will imbibe a quarter more of the same beverage and at night after work he sits in the tap-room till closing time and drinks as much as ever he can pay for or chalk up meanwhile his wife must have her drop of porter in the morning her drop of bitter to dinner and her drop of something hot before going to bed also on saturday afternoons when the twain go marketing together they must have a few drinks just to show there is no ill feeling while on saturday night the artisan not infrequently improves the shining hours by getting blind to use his own elegant phrase thus it quite commonly happens that a third and even a half of the total income of a household of the artisan class is spent in alcohol thrift provision for a rainy day and for old age become an impossibility underfeeding usually walks hand in hand with overdrinking the man loses his nerve the woman her comeliness and her capacity and the end is pauperism and a pauper's grave if nothing worse among the english middle and upper classes there is distinctly a greater tendency to moderation than among the lower classes for all that the middle classes especially can point to a great many brilliant examples of the fine art of soaking publicans betting men commercial travellers proprietors of businesses solicitors clerks journalists and the like get through an amount of drinking in the course of a day which would probably appall even themselves if they kept an account of it let's have a drink is invariably one of the first phrases dropped when two englishmen meet we'll have another is sure to follow and so is hang it man we must have a final among the middle classes too as also among the upper classes there is a very great deal of secret drinking particularly among women and persons whose professional or official positions necessitate the maintenance of an appearance of extreme respectability the grocer's license and his fine stock of carefully selected wines and spirits offer a ready means of supply to the female dipsomaniac who would not be seen in a public house for worlds besides gin can be charged as tea in a grocery account and many a bottle of brandy has figured in such accounts under the innocent pseudonym of rolled ox tongue though the english upper classes as i have said drink with a certain moderation their moderation really embraces a quantity of liquor which would send the artisan quite off its head 
whiskies and sodas at noon burgundy at lunch with cognac to one's coffee three kinds of wine at dinner followed by liqueurs and whisky make no appreciable mark on a man who is living at his ease and can sleep as long as he likes but the sum total of alcohol is quite considerable and probably greater than that consumed by the drunken sot for whom my lord has such contempt of english drinking generally one may remark that it is done in a very deliberate and unsociable way the english cannot be said to drink for company's sake they do not foregather and carry on their drinking merrily in their cups they are neither witty nor happy but just dull and dour and inclined to be quarrelsome they drink for drinking's sake for the sake of intoxication and to drown trouble i wish them good luck and less of their vile concoctions chapter sixteen food the subject of diet he prefers to call it diet is apparently one of unlimited interest to the englishman meet him where you will he is ever ready to discuss first the weather and then the things that is to say the kinds of food that agree with him indeed you could almost stake your life on extracting from any strange englishman you happen to come across some such statement as i can't abide eggs or veal always makes me bilious within ten minutes of opening up a conversation with him the englishman's house we are told is his castle and the englishman's hobby surely is his digestion in point of fact ninety-nine per cent of adolescent and adult english people suffer from chronic indigestion in a more or less severe form flatulence heartburn colic and liver are the englishman's mortal heritage he is invariably troubled with some of them and quite commonly with all if you relieved him of them he would scarcely thank you because he has nursed them from his youth up and what he really wants is amelioration and not cure probably this is the reason why in the midst of his wails and his unholy talk about diet he continues to feed in precisely the grossest greasiest and least rational manner that generations of bad feeders have been able to develop of mornings if you sojourn with an english family you will be invited to breakfast at half-past eight promptly at that hour they serve a sort of sickly oatmeal soup compounded apparently of milk and sugar which they call porridge then follow thick and piping hot coffee with ham and eggs fish or a chop and bread and butter and marmalade as a sort of wind-up the man who tackles this menu goes to business belching like a torn balloon by eleven o'clock however he is ready for a little snack oysters and chablis prawns on toast a mouthful of bread and cheese and a bottle of bass or something of that kind then at half-past one there is lunch practically a dinner of several courses or a cut from the joint accompanied by what the english euphoniously term to veg at tea-time your englishman must needs lave himself in a dish of orange pico or bohea to the accompaniment of lumps of cake and at long and last comes dinner the crowning guzzle of the englishman's day and a function usually spread over a couple of hours it will be perceived that this gustatory programme or routine has been copied from the french the french put away two good meals per diem one at noon and the other in the evening and there is no reason why the english should not do the same when you come to think of it dinner in the middle of the day is a low underbred undistinguished arrangement also not to dine at night is to run the risk of not losing one's figure and of having the neighbours say that one cannot afford it the french programme would be all very well if it were carried out on french lines all through but it is not when you say soup in a french restaurant it means that you will be served with half a dozen tablespoonfuls of consomme or petit marmite or bisque as the case may be when the englishman says soup he means enough thick stock to wash a bus down what is more he gets it and swallows it and it is so all down the menu too much of everything and don't you think you can put me off with your blooming homeopathic portions a liberal table no stent good food and plenty of it is one of the bulwarks of english respectability that bad digestion and talks about diet follow is nobody's fault 
this profusion this overfood as it were has been brought to its noblest expression by the english aristocracy whose tables literally groan with costly viands whose spits are always turning and whose scullions and kitchen wenches are as an army it is related that when a certain duke found it necessary to retrench and was advised by his family solicitor to get rid of his fifth sixth and seventh cooks his grace remarked but so-and-so a man must have biscuit the english middle class of course faithfully imitates to the best of its powers the english upper class and so on through the grades among all classes there is a rooted prejudice against food that happens to be cheap to this day people who eat escallop are rather looked down upon for no other reason than that oysters run you into half a crown a dozen while you can get excellent escallops at ninepence so the herring the whiting and other brands of cheap fish are considered little better than offal by persons who can afford to pay for sole and salmon turtle soup is infinitely to be preferred to any other soup in the world because it is dearer and champagne is drunk not because people like it but because it looks swagger and testifies to the possession of means these gustatory idiosyncrasies are purely english and obviously they are the offspring of the english love of display and superfluity among the lower classes the general feeding though cheaper is just as wasteful and just as gross excluding bread it consists chiefly of inferior cuts of butcher's meat with charcuterie and dried fish thrown in it has been complained against the scot that he is none too clean a feeder delighting hugely in inferior meats haggis is held forth as a great exemplar in point but it cannot be denied that throughout england the one kind of emporium for the sale of comestibles which flourishes and is unfailingly popular is the pork or ham and beef shop and here what do you obtain why exactly the meats which gentlemen of the type of mr henley describe as awful they include in addition to pork in and out of season pigs feet pigs heads pigs liver and kidneys pigs blood sausages the savoury duck or a mess of seasoned remnants tripe boiled and raw and chitterlings so that the haggis of scotland is fairly well balanced i am not suggesting for a moment that the english display other than a proper judgment in devouring these dainties but if they will favour the pork shop and its contents they can scarcely expect to be set down for an angel bread and manna eating people perhaps the chief scandal about english feeding lies in the condition of the english hotels on the continent an hotel is an establishment for the accommodation of travellers requiring food and rest in england an hotel is an establishment for the accommodation of landlords and waiters high-class cuisine says the tariff card also wines and spirits of the best selected quality yet one's experience tells one that though the bill will be heavy neither the cuisine nor the wines will be more than passable much less high class a menu which is the same yesterday to-day and forever bad cooking careless service and a general lack of finish are the things one may expect at an english hotel with the tolerable certainty of not being disappointed to complain is to draw forth the ill-disguised contempt of bibulous head-waiters and the stiff apologies of haughty proprietors but beyond that mortal man will never get because the english hotel is an immemorial and conservative institution and as wise in its own conceit as the ancient sphinx of late and in london attempts have been made to organize hotels adapted to the best kind of requirements so far as i am aware only two of them have really succeeded and the charges at both places are quite prohibitive closely identified one might almost say affiliated to the english hotel is the english railway buffet of which so much has been said in song and story the sheer horribleness of the refreshments here provided has passed into a proverb the english themselves admit that if you wish to know the worst about refreshments you should drink the railway buffet tea and partake of the railway buffet sandwich 
they also admit that for abominations in the way of aerated waters milk beer and whiskey pastry cakes hard-boiled eggs cold meats boiled chicken and ham and chops and steaks from the grill the railway buffet takes the palm and they admit further that the hebes who dispense these comestibles to the hungry and howling mob have the manners of duchesses yet the english without their railway buffets would be an utterly woebegone and miserable people put an englishman down at a strange railway station with a half-hour wait before him he has but one resort he inquires right off for the buffet and there he gorges and swizzles till the warning bell advises him of the departure of his train if there is no buffet he becomes a dejected pallid man and threatens to write to the newspapers so long as the railway buffets continue to exist the english digestion can never aspire to perfection even though english feeding and cooking outside railway stations become ideal for a single meal of railway buffet viands would permanently disorganize the digestive capabilities of the most ostrichy ostrich that ever walked on two legs End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the egregious english by t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen law and order the english love to be ruled just as eels are said to take delight in being skinned they hold that a nation which is properly ruled cannot fail of happiness their notion of rule may be summed up in the phrase law and order the englishman believes that law and order are heaven-sent blessings especially invented for his behoof where else in the world he will ask you grandiloquently do you get such law and order as you get in england the land of the free if anybody picks his pocket or encroaches upon his land or infringes his patent rights or diverts his water courses the englishman knows exactly what to do there is the law they keep it on tap in great buildings called courts and persons in wigs serve out to you precisely what you may deserve with great gusto and solemnity the man picked your pocket did he three months imprisonment for the man somebody is making colourable imitations of your patent doll's eyes well you can apply for an injunction and so on this is law all englishmen believe in it particularly those who have never had any when it comes to the worst and the englishman finds that he really must take on a little of his own beautiful specific he usually begins by falling into something of a flutter those bewigged and sedate persons seated in great chairs with bouquets in front of them and policemen to bawl silence for them begin to have a new meaning for the englishman hitherto he has regarded them complacently as the bodily representatives of the law in a free country he has smacked his lips over them rejoiced in their learning wit and acumen warmed at the notion of their dignity and thanked god that he belonged to a free people free england now when it comes to a trifling personal encounter before this mountain of dignity this mountain of dignity perched on a mountain of precedent as it were the englishman shivers and looks pale but his solicitor and his counsel and his counsel's clerk particularly his counsel's clerk soon put him at his ease and instead of withdrawing at the feel of the bath he is fain to plump right in whether he comes out on top or gets beaten is another matter in any case the trouble about the thing is that win or lose it is infinitely and appallingly costly law the englishman's birthright is not to be given away if you want any you must pay for it and pay for it handsomely too otherwise you can go without the english adage to the effect that there is one law for the rich and another for the poor is one of those adages which are very subtly true there is a law for the rich certainly there is also a law for the poor namely no law at all on the whole the englishman who has not had his pristine dream of english law shattered by contact with the realities is to be envied all other englishmen whether their experience has lain in county courts 
high courts or courts of appeal talk lovingly of english law with their tongues in their cheeks with respect to order the much bepraised handmaiden of law i do not think that the english get half so much of her as they think they do she costs them a pretty penny the upkeep of her police and magistrates and general myrmidons runs the englishman into some noble taxation yet where shall you find an english community that is orderly if even an infinitesimal section of it has made up its mind to be otherwise in london at the present moment there are whole districts which it is not safe for a decently dressed person to traverse even in broad daylight and these districts are not by any means slum districts but parts of the metropolis in which lie important arteries of traffic there is not a square mile of the metropolitan area which does not boast its organized gang of daylight robbers purse snatchers watch snatchers and bullies who would beat a man insensible for fourpence and whose great weapon is the belt for convenience sake these people have been grouped together under the term hooligan the police the far-famed london police can do nothing with them they admit that they are ineradicable and irrepressible the magistrates and the newspapers keep on asseverating that something must be done that something apparently consists in the capture of a stray specimen of the tribe who is forthwith given three months with perhaps a little whipping thrown in but hooliganism is a business that continues to flourish like the green bay-leaf and london is no safer to-day than it was in the time of the garroters as the belt is the weapon of the london robber and as hooligan is his name so we find in all the larger provincial towns gangs of scoundrels with special instruments and slang names of their own in lancashire and the black country kicking appears to be the favourite method of dealing with the order-loving citizen in some of the northern towns the knuckle-duster the sandbag, and the loaded stick are requisitioned and in all cases we are told the police are powerless the fact is that on the whole england cannot be reckoned an orderly country the hooligans and their provincial imitators are just straws that show the way of the wind when these persons say we will do such and such things in contravention of the law there is practically nothing to stop them in the same way when a community determines to run amuck on an occasion of national rejoicing such as the late maffa king night or because a strike is in progress or a charity dinner has been badly served or the vaccination laws are being enforced it does so at its own sweet will and order can be hanged once a week too namely on saturday nights english order like the free list at the theatres is entirely suspended saturday night is the recognized and inviolable hour of the mob throughout the country your flaring english gin palaces are at their flaringest the beer pumps sing together with a myriad voices and the clink of glasses takes the evening air with beauty until perhaps eight o'clock all goes well then the quarrelsomeness which the english masses extract from their cups begins to assert itself and the chuckers out in what other country in the world are their chuckers out and the police begin to be busy till long after midnight their hands are full and it is not until the sabbath is a couple of hours old that the english masses seek their rest in the meantime what squalid indiscretions what sins against humanity what outrages have not been committed the bare consumption of drink alone has been appalling the bickerings angry shoutings indulgences in pugilism and hair-pulling have been infinite and on monday morning the police courts will have their usual plethora of drunks and disorderlies wife-beatings and assaults on the police with perhaps a case or two of manslaughter and a murder to put the crown on things in the main however law and order may be counted among john bull's many illusions they are as one might say sweet to meditate upon they look all right on paper and they sound all right in the mouths of orators for the rest the englishman who is wise smiles and keeps a folded tail one may note before leaving this entertaining subject that in england lawyers and laymen alike take a special pride in admitting a certain ignorance 
at the bare mention of scots law they lift up pious hands and impious eyes and say thank heaven we know nothing about it chapter eighteen education lord rosebery whom the worthy mr crossland dislikes on purely racial grounds is usually credited as the originator of what has latterly become the englishman's watchword educate 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 whether it was the scotch half of lord rosebery or the english half that prompted him to this simple human cry i shall not pretend to say on the other hand it is certain that when his lordship offered the english such a profound piece of advice he gave them exactly the counsel that they most needed for though the english boast of their knowledge though they are the arrogant possessors of seats of learning out of which can come nothing but perfection though they possess ancient universities and ancient public schools though they have a school board system and free education and though their country is overrun with middle-sized men who play billiards and drink bitter beer and call themselves schoolmasters they are indubitably and unmistakably an uneducated people until the passing of the elementary education act of eighteen seventy learning in england amounted practically to a luxury only the rich might be permitted to know things it was a case of schools colleges and universities for the sons of noblemen and gentlemen the rascally lower classes might look after themselves it is open to question whether the rascally lower classes were not on the whole educationally better off in that day than they are at present that however is by the way but in the later sixties the reformer got his eagle eye on the rascally lower classes he perceived that the rascally lower classes were in bad case they got drunk they used foul language they smoked short pipes and heaven help them they could not read anticipating the english or scotch half of lord rosbery as the case may be the reformer said educate 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 and so it was the english have been educating ever since they educated to such purpose that thirty years later lord rosebery felt it incumbent upon himself to bid them educate 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 in those thirty years the rascally lower classes learned somewhat they were supposed to discover inter alia that knowledge was power they were told that a hodman who could write his name was a better hodman than the hodman whose sign manual was a cross they were led shrewdly to infer that their pastors and masters and general betters owed their supremacy to knowledge and that if they the rascally lower classes would only instruct their children these same children might wax great in the land and carry burdens no more the rascally lower classes sent their children to school some of them cheerfully some of them with groans and the stars began to shine over england's darkness what has come to pass all men know every englishman gets the smatterings of a literary education and believes in his heart that he was cut out by the almighty to be a clerk the honest trades and handicrafts are no longer desirable in the minds of english youth to take one's coat off with a view to livelihood is a business for dolts and fools advertise in england for an office boy and you shall receive five hundred applications advertise for a boy to learn plumbing and you will be offered perhaps two daft-looking lads who after much thrashing have managed to attain the age of fourteen years the fact is that the english do not know what education means at the public schools and at the universities of oxford and cambridge education has become to a great extent a social matter you go to these places to learn certainly but you also go with a view to the formation of a desirable and influential acquaintance and to get upon your forehead the mark which is supposed to make glorious the public school and university bred englishman as a general rule that mark is altogether imperceptible to the eyes of the unelect who if the truth must be told discover the university man not so much by his manners or conversation as by his ineptitudes when one comes to consider the principles upon which the public school and university system are worked 
one is quite prepared to admit that were it not for the element of snobbery patent in the system english public schools and universities alike would in the long run have to be disestablished as it is they are the conventional resort of aristocratic adolescence and permitted to exist only on condition that if a low middle-class person can find the money and keep up the style he too may join the angelic host to the man of temperament to the scholar to the man who loves learning for learning's sake the english universities have precious little to offer after oxford and cambridge one turns to london and the non-resident foundations all of them i believe modern here as it seems to me the english err again broadly speaking these institutions wittingly or unwittingly devote their energies to the preparation of young men for the civil service if you are an english board school teacher at eighty pounds a year and you discover that a second-class clerk in the circumlocution department commences at three hundred pounds a year and that roughly the examination to be passed is the same as for matriculation at london you naturally go in bald-headed for matriculation at london for the learning you get by these efforts you have not the smallest respect if on presenting yourself for examination by the civil service commissioners you come out sufficiently high on the list to secure an appointment well and good if not your labour has been wasted it is this spirit which is at the bottom of the english ignorance with them learning education is a means to an end and not in the least its own exceeding great reward hence a properly educated englishman is almost as rare as a blue rose for the masses the rascally lower classes that is to say there are the board schools here for thirty years past has been enacted about the sweetest travesty of education that the mind of man could conceive for the teaching of the children of the rascally lower orders the wise english government with the assistance of the wise english school boards has invented what is to all intents and purposes a new type of man and his name shall be called schoolmaster he began heaven knows how but if you inquire into him you will find that he has spent three years at a government training college and that prior to this experience he was for some years a pupil teacher also that he is a son of the people and that his father drove an engine or kept a shop in these latter circumstances he was perhaps fortunate the marvellous fact about him is that in spite of his years of pupil teachership and of his three years at a government training college he is not a man of either learning or culture i am told that an english pupil teacher is not expected to fash himself by the study of either latin or greek two books of euclid will see him through the stiffest of his examinations he does not need to have even a nodding acquaintance with modern languages and as for science if he really wants some he must pick it up at evening classes even when he passes into the government training college where by the way he is instructed and boarded and lodged gratis his studies do not become in any way profound the history of england the geography of the world arithmetic according to barnard smith algebra according to dr todhunter latin and greek according to dr william smith part one with a little french a very little french bring him to the end of his tether really the whole business is childish any youth of average capacity should get through the entire three years course in six weeks of course there is the so-called technical training to reckon with that is to say a man at one of these colleges is supposed to spend a great deal of his time and no doubt does in perfecting himself as a teacher but one would have thought that actual practice in an ordinary school would be the best instructor in this respect in any case nobody can consider closely the english schoolmaster as manufactured at government training colleges without perceiving that the government turns out a very remarkable article indeed i have no desire to belittle a hard-worked and probably underpaid body of public servants 
their profession is a thankless one i do not think for a moment a single man of them went into it with his eyes open and i know for a certainty that the school boards and the government between them have so hedged it round with petty annoyances that a man possessed of feeling must loathe it it is probably this feeling of loathing of his work that keeps the english schoolmaster down he knows that it is vain for him to go a hair's breadth out of the beaten tracks the school boards must have grants the government inspectors must be satisfied there is only one method of ensuring these desirable consummations that one way amounts to sheer mechanism and slog the english schoolmaster must have no temperament if he possesses such a thing he is bound to come to great grief hence the whole weight of the english system is from first to last employed in the work of knocking temperament out of him and keeping it out his three years free training particularly tend to make a slack unthinking sap head of him he gets a parchment which entitles him to call himself a certificated teacher and he is taught to imagine that for downright learning there is nothing like himself under the sun in this latter surmise he is quite right the schoolmaster in england though he will probably be another quarter of a century waking up to the fact counts for next to nothing men of parts avoid him men of no parts laugh at him for himself i imagine he will long continue to believe in his heart that he is a great man a little lower perhaps than a parson but certainly a little higher than a policeman the real value of english education like the real value of most other things becomes apparent when it is put to the test of practical affairs any employer of labor will tell you that whether an english boy come to him from a school board or a school of a higher grade whether he be the son of a ploughman or of what the english call a professional man he is always and inevitably a good deal of a fool you have to teach him how to lick stamps you have to teach him that excepting in so far as he can write and read what he has learned at school is not wanted you have to teach him how many beans make five you have to teach him that punctuality and accuracy are worth more in business than all the botany he ever learned and all the time you have to watch him like a cat watching a mouse fire out the fools once exclaimed dr robertson nicole i do not think it is too much to say that if the average english employer took the hint he would have nobody left to do his business for him End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of the egregious english by t w h crossland this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen recreation to amuse oneself is the great art of life from the english point of view the finest kind of amusement is to be obtained by killing something fox hunting deer stalking grouse shooting pheasant shooting pigeon shooting and even rabbit shooting still stand for a great deal among the best class of englishmen of old the masses had their bull baitings dog fights and cock fights these however are no longer regarded as legitimate forms of amusement and the masses being for various reasons unable to hunt foxes and shoot peasants have to fall back on recreations in which killing takes place only by accident there is the race course and the football field the masses are expected to consider themselves happy outside racing and football however the come day go day englishman has a good many facilities for recreation although in most communities the grandfatherly authorities have abolished the old feasts and fairs which provided periodic saturnalia of merry-go-rounds and wild beast shows it is a poor townlet which cannot nowadays boast its permanent settlement of coconut shies and shooting galleries where on saturday evenings the true-born englishman may find substantial joys then for the londoner in addition to this kind of thing there are from time to time provided vast orgies at hampstead heath the welsh harp barnet fair and other choice resorts 
here again it is a case of coconuts and shooting galleries swing boats steam roundabouts and aerial flights backed up with donkey rides a free use of the tickler and the ladies teaser unlimited confetti throwing and unlimited beer these amusements of course are on the face of them quite innocent and equally english and unintellectual failing merry-go-rounds and coconut shies the delights of which are apt to pall the english masses have still left to them their main redoubt of rational enjoyment which for reasons no man may skill is called the music hall the english music hall is practically an expansion or efflorescence of the old-fashioned sing-song sixty years ago the man who went out to take a stoop of ale at his inn was accustomed to be regaled with a little music free of charge mine host had possessed himself of a second-hand piano and secured the services of some broken-down musician to play it for him there was a great singing of old songs and the time sped merrily as it did in the golden age these feasts of harmony brought custom and in course of time the evening sing-songs at certain hostelries became organized institutions and were run on lines of great enterprise the piano being supplemented by an orchestra and the pianist by a number of professional singers and entertainers within the last fifty years the sing-song has been separated from its parent the alehouse and has developed into the music hall Today the English music halls are almost as thick on the ground as churches and chapels. In the metropolis you would have a difficulty to count them. In the provinces every town of size supports two or three halls and insists on London talent and London style. The class of entertainment provided may be costly and amusing, but it is certainly not edifying. The performers, almost to a man, and one might say to a woman, are persons who can be considered artists only in the broadest sense, and whose ignorance and vulgarity are as colossal as their salaries. Roughly, the entertainment may be divided into two sections, the one concerned with feats of strength, juggling, and the like, and the other with laughter-making and vocalism as regards the first of these sections a man who can balance a horse and trap on the end of his chin appears to give great satisfaction to an english audience why this should be so nobody knows the good purpose that may be served by balancing a horse and trap on the end of one's chin is not obvious but the english masses are ravished by the spectacle they also have a great fondness for the stout lady who catches cannon-balls on the back of her neck for the other stout lady who risks her life nightly on the flying trapeze for the gentleman who walks about the stage with a piano under one arm and a live mule under the other and for the gentleman who rides the bicycle standing on his head to the mind of the english masses these are marvels and well worth the money they give a zest to life and they provide material for conversation and their attraction seems perennial the great standby of the halls however is the laughter-making and vocal department here shine the great stars whose names are familiar on english lips as household words here is pervaded the culture the song and the humour of the english masses it is from the music hall stage that the vast majority of englishmen take their tone and their sentiment that renowned comedian fred fetchem strolls on to the boards of the frivolity some night and assuming a fiendish grin exclaims idiotically that's air next morning and for many weeks thereafter all england says there's air on any and every occasion what oh she bumps now why shan't be long not half did he and similar catchwords all popular and all meaningless capture the english imagination in their turn and for a season at any rate englishmen can say nothing else it is the same with the music-hall song always there are current in england three or four songs of the hour which every englishman worth the name sings whistles or hums and always these songs from whatever point of view regarded are of the most blithering and bathotic nature at the present moment the prime and universal favorite is that pathetic ditty everybody's loved by some one for the benefit of the english i quote the first stanza and the chorus of this work 
a lady stood within a busy city her darling little daughter by her side she'd stopped to buy a bunch of pretty violets from a ragged little orphan she espied the words she spoke were kinder than the boy had heard for years and in reply to what she asked he murmured through his tears everybody's loved by some one everybody knows that's true some have father and mother dear sister and brother too all the time that i remember since i was a mite so small i seem to be the only one that nobody loves at all with this enchanting song the english welkin resounds by day and night the great broad-shouldered genial englishman full of four ale and bad whisky howls it in chorus at his favourite public work girls sing it in factories mothers rock their children to sleep with it and every english urchin whistles or shouts it at you with unflagging zest of course there are others for example there is i'm a policeman which goes like this in the inky hour of midnight when the clock is striking three as i stroll along my beet route many curious things i see ragged urchins stagger past me to their mansions in the west millionaires through cold and hunger on our doorsteps sink to rest dirty dustmen in their broughams off to supper at the cry then bill sykes the burglar passes with an eyeglass in his eye such are the sights i witness when i am on my beat filling my heart with sawdust filling my boots with feet covering half the pavement up with my plates of meat though mother sent to say that i'm a policeman which uh, need one remark is intended for what the scots are supposed to call woot also there is he stopped pendleberry plum had a wart on his gum and he rubbed it with sandpaper hard the wart on his gum made plum fairly hum when it stuck out about half a yard the wart grew so quick when he rubbed it with a brick till it looked like a short billiard cue said plum to himself i shall die on the shelf for i'm darned if i know what to do so he went and got a pickaxe and shoved it underneath then he lifted up his jaw and he swallowed all his teeth and then he stopped the verses i have quoted are a good true and fair sample of the kind of thing that finds favour among the english masses i do not think that anything better is being proffered and it is pretty certain that anything less inane would be doomed to failure the fact is that the english mind in the lump is flat coarse and maggoty and the english understanding is as the understanding of a feeble and ill-bred child a couple of generations ago the songs popular among englishmen had some claim to coherence decency and common sense nowadays however the englishman admits that he cannot sing the old songs he has gone farther and fared worse and among the many symptoms of his decadence none is more pronounced than his easy toleration of the balderdash that is being served up to him by the alls chapter twenty stock exchange there is nothing in england more astounding or more tigerish than the city man englishmen have a fixed idea that they are the soul of generosity indifferent to money and not in the least sordid when they are put to it for a type of sheer greediness it pleases them to point a finger at the scot yet there can be no doubt that of late years the desire for riches has become the absorbing english passion the ostentation and vulgar displays of the aristocracy and the newly rich have stirred the middle-class english heart to envy how comes it that such and such a man sleeps on lilies and eats roses he has means my friend and what are means just money if you are going to be happy in this life if you insist upon a full paunch of the choicest upon the ease and softness which are so grateful to decadent persons if you would be in a position to possess all that the soul of the decadent person covets you really must have money and as you are a middle-class englishman whose people have omitted to leave you a million or so it is very awkward for you life is short the cup goes round but once you have five hundred pounds how is it to be made into fifty thousand pounds and that while the flush of youth still incarnadines your ambitious cheek there is only one way you must speculate 
judiciously if you can but you must speculate you are an englishman and a sportsman and sometimes you get your fifty thousand pounds then all the world marvels and would fain do likewise so that the ball is kept rolling it is a ball full of money and it rolls cityward the generous open-handed englishmen who are the city take as much as they want and toss you the balance the game is as fashionable as ping-pong everybody plays it and win or lose everybody calls it the stock exchange i am told that the stock exchange proper is a reputable institution and essential to the well-being of the country i do not doubt this for a moment but round it there has grown up a specious and parasitical finance which is rapidly transforming the english into a nation of punters fortunes made while you wait is the lure to which the latter-day englishman has been found infallibly to respond the remnant of the common sense possessed by his excellent grandparents arouses in him a sneaking suspicion that the golden promises of the outside broker and the bucket shopkeeper are not to be depended upon yet he reads in his morning paper that no end of stocks and shares have risen a point or dropped a point as the case may be and he knows that if he had been in on the right side he would have made more money in a few hours than his excellent grandparents would have made in the course of a whole grubby lifetime hence sooner or later his patrimony or few hundred of surplus capital is planked into the ball that rolls citywards on the off chance that it may come back arm in arm as it were with thousands even the more cautious sort of englishman who looks upon speculation with a deprecating eye and pins his faith on legitimate investment is rapidly descending into the gambling habit schemes which promise fat dividends inflame his imagination and drag him out of the even tenor of his way he is perfectly well aware that fifteen twenty and twenty five per cent in return for one's money is quite wrong somehow but on the other hand the prospect ravishes and there are concerns in the world which pay such dividends year by year without turning a hair only sometimes there is a colossal smash and half the shopkeepers of england put on sackcloth and ashes and get up funds for one another's relief to the looker-on the whole system is highly diverting to the players in the game the fun will never be obvious the real truth about the matter is simply this the standard of living in england is an inflated and artificial standard practically every englishman lives or longs to live beyond his means the workman and the workman's wife must put on the style of the foreman and the foreman's wife and the foreman and the foreman's wife must appear to be nearly as comfortably off as the manager the manager as his employer all employers shopkeepers factory owners ironmasters engineers printers and even publishers as prosperous as each other and so on till you come to dukes than whom of course nobody can be more prosperous it would be possible to bring together six englishmen whose incomes ranged from one pound ten shilling a week to fifty pounds a year and whose dress and taste would be pretty well identical fifty years ago the sons of the middle classes had really no inclination toward the superfluities the dandy was rather laughed at among them the gourmet was a monster they never by any chance encountered and the libertine was a sad warning and a person to be eschewed nowadays it is all the other way the gilt and tinsel and glamour and rapidity of the gay world have captured the english understanding and brought it exceedingly low there is little moral backbone left in the country money 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 to be ill-gotten and ill-spent is the english ideal the man who can go without is considered a crank or a fool or worse or he is set down for an indolent fellow who should be given a month or two on the treadmill for luck the whole duty of man of englishmen that is to say is to have money in ponderable quantities the man without it is of no account at all nobody believes in him nobody wants him nobody tolerates him he may be wise and witty and chaste and blessed with all the virtues and still be received with great coldness by bank managers and it is well known that the attitude of a bank manager towards a man is the attitude of society at large if the bank manager beams and rubs his hand god's in his heaven all's right with the world 
if the bank manager frowns and sends you impertinent letters you may last a week or a fortnight or a few months but you are on thin ice and you must please take care not to forget it i should not be at all surprised if the omnipotent official whose business it is to discover what persons are or are not qualified to approach our british fountain of honour were one day found to be a bank manager in disguise so that on the whole the englishman has every inducement to get rich and to be very quick about it his dealings with the stock exchange that is to say with the city are but the natural expression of his anxiety to oblige all parties concerned it is a pity that getting and spending should become the main concerns of his life but as he pathetically puts it one must do as rome does and some women are never content the stock exchange is the only way chapter twenty one the beloved what is more beautiful or meet to be taken to the bosom than the englishman everybody loves him his goings to and fro upon the earth are as the progresses of one who has done all men good he drops fatness and blessings as he walks he smiles benignity and graciousness and i am glad to see you all looking so well and before him runs one in plush crying who is the most popular man of this footstool and all the people shall rejoice and say the englishman god bless him hence it comes to pass that in whatever part of the world the englishman may find himself he has a feeling that he is thoroughly at home i am as welcome as flowers in may he says those poor foreigners those poor heathen are glad to see me they never have any money poor devils and were it not for our whirring spindles at home i verily believe they would have nothing to wear in the brief the englishman abroad is always in a sort of father christmassy santa claus frame of mind he eats well he drinks well and he sleeps well he calls for the best and he pays for it it is a wonderful thing to do and it goes straight to the hearts of the poor foreigner and the poor heathen this at any rate is the englishman's own view it is a pleasing consoling and stimulating view and it would ill become an unregenerate outsider rudely to disturb it indeed i question whether the englishman in his blindness and adipose conceit would allow you to disturb it when persons in france say a bas l'anglais your fat englishman smiles and says little boys when people put rude pictures of him on german postcards he smiles again and says that the flowing tide of public opinion in germany is entirely with him when dutch farmers propose to throw him into the sea he becomes very red in the neck splutters somewhat and says i'm sure they will make excellent subjects in time and when the savage americans desire to chaw him up and swallow him he says you astonish me i have always been under the impression that blood was thicker than water his desire is to live at peace with all men but his notion of peace is to have his hand in both your pockets and no questions asked he owns two-thirds of the habitable globe vide the geography books and every pint of sea is his pace the popular song he owns also everything that is worth owning he is the pierpont morgan of the universe who could help loving him on the other hand the excellent j b has not escaped calumny if i were disposed to reproduce some of the slanders upon him it goes without saying that they would make a rather large chapter all manner of foreign writers have time and time again had a fling at the englishman they love him but their love is not blind they perceive that he has faults of a grievous nature and they write accordingly curiously enough too quite severe criticisms of john bull have been written in his own household mr wilfred scowen blunt for example who is an englishman and apparently innocent of celtic taint actually goes so far as to call the englishman an anglo-norman dog down to the latest born the hungriest of the pack the master wolf of all men called the sassenach the anglo-norman dog who goeth by land and sea as his forefathers went in chartered piracy death fire in his right hand and the english poet goes on to elaborate his indictment against the englishman thus 
he hath outlived the day of the old single graspings where each went his way alone to plunder all he hath learned to curb his lust somewhat to smooth his brawls to guide his passionate gusts his cry of mine 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 in inarticulate wrath he dareth not make raid on goods his next friend hath with open violence nor lose his hand to steal save in community and for the common weal twixt saxon man and man he is more congruous grown holding a subtler plan to make the world his own by organized self-seeking in the paths of power he is new drill to wait he knoweth his appointed hour and his appointed prey of all he maketh tool even of his own sad virtues to cajole and rule we are told further that the beloved has tarred time's features pockmarked nature's face and brought all to the same jakes whatever that may mean also there is no sentient thing polluteth and defileth as this saxon king this intellectual lord and sage of the new quest the only wanton he that fouleth his own nest and still his boast goeth forth this is an english opinion and consequently worth the money mr blunt assures us that in putting it forth he has the approval of no less a philosopher than mr herbert spencer and no less an idealist than mr george frederick watts i have not says mr blunt shrunk from insisting on the truth that the hypocrisy and all-acquiring greed of modern england is an atrocious spectacle one which if there be any justice in heaven must bring a curse from god as it has surely already made the angels weep the destruction of beauty in the name of science the destruction of happiness in the name of progress the destruction of reverence in the name of religion these are the pharisaic crimes of all the white races but there is something in the anglo-saxon impiety crueler still that it also destroys as no other race does for its mere vainglorious pleasure the anglo-saxon alone has in our day exterminated root and branch whole tribes of mankind he alone has depopulated continents species after species of their wonderful animal life and is still yearly destroying and this not merely to occupy the land for it lies in large part empty but for his insatiable lust of violent adventure to make record bags and kill when the beloved comes across reading of this sort he no doubt sheds bitter tears and remembers how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child and he goes on his way rejoicing unimpressed and unreformed the fact of the matter is that from the beginning john bull though possessed of a great reputation for honesty and munificence has never really been any better than he should be when he interfered between tyrant and slave when he went forth to conquer savage persons and to annex savage lands which somehow invariably flowed with milk and honey he made a point of doing it with the air of a philanthropist and for centuries the world took him at his own estimate even in the late war the great cry was that he did not want gold mines as a general rule he never wants anything but he always gets it it is only of late that the world has begun to find him out and that he himself has begun to have qualms he feels in his bones that something has gone wrong with him it may be a slight matter and not beyond repair but there it is he cannot put his hand on his heart and say i am the fine substantial sturdy truth-speaking incorruptible magnanimous genial englishman of half a century ago the fly has crept into the ointment of his virtue and the fragrance of it no longer remains his attitude at the present moment is the attitude of the anxious man who perceives that life is a little too much for him and keeps on saying we shall have to buck up he is in two minds about most things over which he was once cocksure he could not quite tell you for example whether he continues to stand at the head of the world's commerce or not once there was no doubt about it now well it is a question of statistics and you can prove anything by statistics out of america men have come to buy english things which were deemed unpurchasable the american has come and seen and purchased and done it quite quickly the englishman is a little puzzled his slow wits cannot altogether grasp the situation we must buck up he says and take measures while there is still time 
he does not see that the new order is upon him and that inevitably and for his good he must be considerably shaken up his own day has been a lengthy a roseful and a gaudy one it has been a day of ease and triumph and comfortable going and the beloved has become very wealthy and a trifle stout in consequence whether to-morrow is going to be his day too and whether it is going to be one of those nice loafing sunshiny kind of days that the beloved likes are open questions it is to be hoped devoutly that fate will be kind to him he needs the sympathy of all who are about him he wants encouragement and support and a restful time it is said that his majesty of portugal who has just left these shores on being asked what had impressed him most during his visit replied the roast beef nothing else sir inquired his interlocutor yes said the monarch the boiled beef and there is a great deal in it through much devouring of beef the english have undoubtedly waxed a trifle beefy it is their beefiness and suetness that fatty degeneration in fact which impresses you recognizing his need of props and stays and abdominal belts as it were the beloved has latterly taken to remembering the colonies he is now of opinion that he and his sturdy children overseas should be knit together in bonds of closer unity to present an unbroken front to the world should share the burdens and glories of empire and so on and so forth the colonies good bodies saw it all at once they had been accustomed to be snubbed and neglected and left out of count and they had forgotten to whom they belonged in his hour of need the beloved cried help i said i didn't want you but i do i do and the colonies went to his aid at a dollar a day per head the prettiest lot of freebooters and undesirable characters they found themselves able to muster later they sent several landau loads of premiers and politicians who were fed and flattered to their hearts content and went home no doubt greatly impressed with the english roast and boiled beef these gentlemen made speeches in return for their dinners they were allowed to visit the colonial office and kiss the hand of mr chamberlain they saw peter robinson's and the tuppany tube and the bonds of empire have been knit closer ever since not to put too fine a point upon it the englishman's attempt to buttress himself up out of the colonies has proved a ghastly failure the scheme fell flat the english may want the colonies but the colonies do not want the english at any rate on bonds of unity lines the banner of imperialism which has waved so gloriously during the past lustrum will have to be furled and put away the great imperial idea declines to work it has been brought on the political stage half a century too late at best it was a fetch and it has failed the all-beloved will have to find some other way out whether he is quite equal to the task may be reckoned another question one supposes that he will try for there is life in the old dog yet at any rate according to the old dog end of chapter twenty one end of the egregious english by t w h crossland